All right, thank you very much, Council. Uh, Ms. Bo, if you would, would you listen very carefully to the question that's asked uh, and answer only the precise question that is asked of you? Also, if one of the attorney makes an objection after the question has been asked, don't answer the question until I rule on the objection, okay? Yes. Great, thank you. Mr. Darden, you may continue. <coughs> The last objection sustained. It's been so long, I don't even remember. <laughs> it was a very good question, Your Honor. Yes, it was because it, it was not a statement okay. by the defendant. Um, Now, the reason that, that the defendant came to your home on those few occasions you just mentioned a moment ago, okay, how did you learn the reasons? Was it from watching something or from talking to someone? That's what he told me. Okay. That's what the defendant told you. Is that right? You have to answer out loud. Yes. Okay. The defendant, what did the defendant tell you? What reason did he give you for coming over to your house. Overruled. <coughs> he didn't have to give me a reason. The boys were back and forth. My kitchen door was open. I was working in the kitchen. He would be coming by to see Nicole and the children. He didn't tell me why he wasn't allowed in the house that day. He just hung out in my kitchen for a while. Okay. Did he tell you that he wasn't allowed in the house that day? Yes, he did. Okay. And you would have conversations with the defendant, is that right? One time I fed him a piece of peach cobbler. Another time we stood and talked. Yes, we had dialogue. Okay. Did you talk about Nicole Brown? I did not talk about Nicole. Did the defendant talk about Nicole? The defendant talked about Nicole. Okay. What did he tell you? What did he say about Nicole? That she wouldn't let him in the house. Okay. Did he and say And he told me that she, I had heard a, an argument between them prior to one of these occasions. And from what fragments I heard, she was angry at him about. Please let her Next. continue, Your Honor. Next question, Mr. Dark. You heard an argument between the defendant and Nicole Brown? Yes, I did. You could hear the defendant speaking? My kitchen door was open. I could hear the defendant speaking. They were going through the driveway, which is right next to my back door. And they were arguing? Yes, they were. And could you discern from what the defendant was saying uh, what it was that they were arguing about? Yes, I could. What were they arguing about? Come on over here to the sidebar with the reporter, please. Thank you, Council. Mr. Darden, you may continue. Okay. During the kitchen conversations you had with the defendant, what, if anything, did he tell you about the nature of his relationship with Nicole Brown? He implied that she was upset over his womanizing, but that that was in the past. 
The womanizing was in the past. Is there a park uh, located near your home? Not on foot, but there is a park nearby, yes. What's the name of that park? Kenter Canyon Recreation Center. Okay. Was there ever an occasion in which you had a conversation with the, de with the defendant at, at that park? Yes, there was. Okay. And do you recall when that was? It was around the same time. Okay. In the spring. Okay. Did you and the defendant go to the park together? We went with our two boys and Nicole. And while at the park, did you and the defendant have a conversation regarding the nature of his relationship with Nicole Brown? That was part of the conversation. Yes, we did. Okay. And what was the general subject matter of the rest of the conversation? I was addressing what I recognized as his stress. Okay. The dependent, the, sorry, the, the, the defendant seemed to be under stress? Yes, he did. Now, what caused you to think or believe that the defendant was under stress? Well, he was arguing loudly, and also I saw a lot of the white of his eye showing between the lid and the iris. And that's an indication of stress. And I brought it to his attention okay. at one point during the dialogue, and we talked about that. Okay. Well, who was he arguing loudly with? Nicole. What was he saying to Nicole? Uh, I gather that he was angry at her thinking that she had been with another man, and she was angry at him for being angry at her. Could you elaborate on that? Well, after a while, she wouldn't argue anymore, and she just fumed on a stone wall. So I was stuck with OJ. Okay. okay. And you had a conversation with the defendant then? Yes, I did. Okay. And tell us. Tell us the conversation you had with the defendant at that time. Well, he said that she was sleeping with somebody who had been staying at her house. And I was reluctant to discuss it. But because he seemed so upset, I felt I could put his mind more at ease by telling him that I didn't think she was. In fact, I was sure she wasn't because my boy was over for overnights and Nicole had specifically told me that this individual was staying in the spare room. And when my son was there for an overnight, the next day I did ask him where he had stayed, where the guest had stayed. And my son told me that he had stayed in the spare room. But when I told OJ that, he scoffed at me as though to indicate that I shouldn't believe her. But I, do, I did believe her because she had never lied to me. About, I had no reason to think that she would ever lie to me. I couldn't convince. Hold on. Next question. Was the defendant upset or angry during that conversation? Yes, he was very upset. And were you able to relieve his stress somehow? Eventually I was. How long did it take you? Well, I'm not sure I entirely succeeded, but maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Why aren't you sure that you entirely succeeded? Because he was convinced that I was mistaken, that he knew how things were. Was the defendant and Nicole Brown living together at that time? No, he was not. He was divorced at that time. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Shapiro? Certainly.
Good morning. I'm Robert Shapiro. I represent Mr. Simpson. Good morning, Mr. Shapiro. How are you today? How would you prefer that I address you? Miss Bo is fine. Miss Bo, because okay, everybody has different connotations these days, and I don't want to insult you at all. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro. How long uh, had you known Nicole Simpson in 1992? I really became friends with Nicole Brown Simpson when she moved in next door. Which was when? So it was I don't remember when she moved in. Can you give us an approximate uh, year or month? Does somebody know what year when she moved in next door to me? All right, let me go let me go on to another question. Uh, did you know O.J. Simpson prior to the time that Nicole Simpson moved in next door to you? No, I did not. And when Nicole Simpson moved in, she moved in at the time that she was going through a separation and later a divorce. That's right. And the incidents that you're relating to now in April of 1992 uh, took place during the time that the divorce was pending, which was filed in about February. Is that correct? I believe the divorce was final at that time. In 92? Am I mistaken? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's a court record. Uh, I mean, if we're going to argue about the date of the divorce, All right, counsel, we're going to be counsel, here counsel, hold on. The date, the date of the legal documents and the date of the divorce are not disputed. So, Mr. Shapiro, why don't you proceed? Yes. Uh, the date of the divorce, she filed for divorce in February of 92, and the divorce was final six months later in October, or thereabouts, eight months. Uh, to put that in perspective now, when uh, you saw O.J. Uh, Simpson during this period of time, did you ever see him in the company of uh, his son and your son? Yes, I did. On how many occasions? A half dozen. And did he ever uh, accompany uh, your son and his son uh, to uh, athletic practices? Yes, he did. So you would find nothing unusual about Mr. Simpson coming to your house at all, would you? No, not at all. And if he came to your house, uh, would you find it unusual if he wanted to go next door and visit or talk to somebody who he was going through a divorce with? Overruled. Can you say that again? Would you find it unusual that uh, while he was coming to uh, bring his son to play with your son, that he might want to stop by next door and uh, talk to a woman who he was going through a divorce with? You mean he would come by and stop by and talk with Nicole? I'm saying, would you find it unusual if he came by with uh, his son to visit your son that he might, during that same visit, go next door and check in and see uh, Nicole? It would be unlikely that he would come to my house without going to Nicole's house, yes. And. During the time that uh, Nicole lived next door to you, did you ever see any evidence of any physical abuse on Nicole? No, I did not. The uh, individual that your son said was spending the night with Nicole the day that uh, your son, the night your son slept over? Sustain. The question. You referred to an incident where there was a discussion about a gentleman uh, being over at Nicole's house, and O.J. had uh, some degree of being uh, concerned about that and discussed it with you. Is that correct? Yes. Was that gentleman's name Keith? Yes. And Nicole had told you that nothing happened between herself and Keith? of any sexual nature. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> o 
overruled. You can answer the question. I can answer the question? Yes. Nicole told me that he slept in the spare bedroom. We did not discuss whether or not they were or had been or were becoming lovers. And O.J. said that he was upset because he believed that there was some sexual activity in the close proximity of children, including your son. No, I don't think he was concerned about whether it was in the proximity of the children. I think he was concerned of whether it was his wife. On occasion, uh, would you know O.J. to bring flowers by to Nicole? I, have, I did see the flowers that he left for her and that he had delivered to her. And on the particular occasion that you're talking about uh, in April, uh, before you realized it was O.J. Simpson and your suspicions were aroused, was there anything unusual about the way he was walking uh, up to uh, her house? Unusual? Yeah. Probably the only thing unusual about it was that it was 11.30 at night. And you don't know whether Nicole was home or not, do you? I assume Nicole was home. And you don't know whether he had been invited to come over or not, do you? No, I don't. And he wasn't dressed in any unusual way, was he? No, no. Didn't have any hats on or any disguises on? No. And uh, as far as parking the car, let me uh, mark two photographs, if I might, for identification, please, Your Honor. Sure, without the reporter. All right, noted. Thank you, Council. You may. Thank you very much. Excuse me. Can you identify these two photographs for the jury, please? Yes, I can. This is my house here, which is on the corner of Gretna Green and Shetland Lane. Here is Nicole's house, her driveway, and here's the little stone wall. My kitchen door is in the back there. The boys would be back and forth across the wall. This photograph is identified. I don't have my glasses on. What's the name of this? Uh, P24. And the second photograph? Uh, this is Nicole's house with the garage door closed. And would you identify that photograph? P23. Now, P23 is directly in front of uh, Nicole's house? Yes, it is. It shows cars uh, right in front? Yes. Now, there are large trees there, are there not? Yes, there are. And are those the type of trees that tend to uh, drop a lot of berries and other types of residue? Well, those are bottle brush trees. And they have big red blossoms, like brushes. Do you know that there may be some people who prefer not to park uh, nice cars under trees that have a propensity to shed? No, those are jacaranda trees. Well, the we're getting a great, a great lesson in uh, trees here today. The jacaranda trees are actually in front of my house. Well, if somebody didn't know the difference between those trees, <laughs> and, and somebody took great care in their car, do you think they might uh, have a little bit of anxiety about parking there? I think they might have anxiety about parking on that street because it, Gretna Greenway is a through street and you might not want to park your car um, on a through street. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Do you want to show the uh, jurors those photos? Yes. All right. Mr. Darden, redirect. Parallel people 24 and asking to put it up on the screen. 
All right, and Ms. Bo, there's a monitor right to your right there. Do you see that? Yes, I do. All right. Now, the house on the left, is, is that your home? Yes, that is. Okay. And the house to the right of the photograph, that would be 325 South Gretna Green? That's right. Okay, there's a nice big driveway there, is that correct? That's right. Showing, uh, showing you people's 23. There are two cars parked there in front of 325 South Red and Green. Is that correct? That's right. Do you know who, the, who owns those cars who they belong to? No, I don't. Did you ever see the defendant park his car in the driveway? Yes, many times. Directly beneath that big tree, uh, well, I saw the, I saw him park in the driveway, which isn't directly beneath the tree, and I saw him park on Gretna Greenway um, in front of the house sometimes as well. How many times did you see him park on Shetland? Several times. And that would be around the corner, is that correct? That's right. And on those occasions, those occasions that he parked his car on Shetland, was there room for him to park his car in the driveway in the cold? Well, I can't remember every occasion that he parked on Shetland Lane. There may have been, there may not have been. Sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes she parked her car in the garage. Sometimes she left it in the driveway. Thank you, that's all. Mr. Shapiro? No all right, Ms. Bell, thank you very much for coming in. Please Your don't Honor. discuss your testimony with anybody no, else won't. except to the lawyers until the end of the case. All right, yes, thank you very much, ma'am. Good day. All right, Mr. Darden, your next witness, please. Certainly. Please raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear that the testimony you may give in the cause now pleading before this court should be the truth of what truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God? Yes, I do. Please have a seat in the witness stand and state and spell your first and last names for the record. My name is Carl Colby, C A R L C O L B Y. Mr. Colby, the, the the witness that just testified a moment ago, that's your wife, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, sir, throughout 1992 and 1993, were you living uh, in a home located at the intersection of Shetland and uh, Gretna Green? Yes, we were living on the northwest corner of Shetland and Gretna Green. Okay. Uh, Two-story house, cheek to jowl with uh, 325. Okay. So Nicole Brown's home was directly next door to yours during April of 1992, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And you have a son, is that correct? Yes, we have a son, uh, now six years old, who um, was in school with uh, Justin Simpson, um, OJ's son, and they were best friends, and uh, they saw each other constantly, 
And um, uh, when they moved in, actually, next door, it was a big surprise and, uh, and a terrific event because two friends who were, went to school together were now uh, living side by side. So they saw each other nearly every day. Okay. And, uh, and you became acquainted with the defendant here, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. And you became acquainted with Nicole Brown? Yes, more with Nicole Brown because she lived there and we would just have more encounters with her. When did Nicole Brown move into the house next door, if you know? Um, I believe it was in the beginning of 1992. January 1992? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And when she moved into the house, did the defendant move into the house with her? No, he did not. Now, directing your attention to the last week of April 1992. Did you have an occasion to call 911? Uh, yes, I did. And what caused you to call 911? Well, it was an evening, um, approximately 10:30 or 11 o'clock at night, and it's a very, res it's a residential neighborhood, very quiet. And sometimes before retiring, I look, just go check the locks and look around downstairs, make sure the lights are off, things like that. And I happened to look outside, and I saw a man um, outside on the sidewalk. And what was that man doing? Um, he was standing on the sidewalk looking at what apparently was the residence next door, to the, directly to the north of us. And what time of the night was this? I'd say it was approximately between 10.30 and 11 o'clock that night. Okay. So the man was standing on the sidewalk? Yes. He, initially, when I first spotted him, he was standing about five yards south of the driveway and relatively stationary looking at the house. And then since I saw him, I was curious, and I didn't recognize him. So I thought to myself, what is a man of this description doing outside at that time? So. Sustained. All right, Mr. Darden, next question. So you became curious? Yes, I was curious. Okay. And did you continue to watch the man? Yes, I did. What did you see the man do? I saw him um, observe the residence next door and then walk uh, around the corner, which would be southerly and then westerly on Shetland, and then go back around again and look again at that residence. And I was a little bit concerned because... Okay, well, let me just stop you there. All right. So that is clear. When you first saw the man, he was on the sidewalk five feet from Nicole Brown's driveway. <laughs> Actually, it misstates the answer. Five yards. yards. Five yards. Okay. And then he walked back around the corner? Yes, and then he walked uh, on a southerly direction and then back um, around the corner. Our house is on a corner like this. So then went okay. southerly and then westerly and then back around again. Okay. And did he walk back to the, to the same spot he was in yes, when he saw he him initially? How many times did you see this man walk? Uh, within five yards of Nicole Brown's driveway and then walk uh, well, back around the corner? Just those two incidents. Okay. And you, were you concerned at all? Well, I was concerned because I, first of all, I didn't... Your Honor, it's been asked. It's been asked if he was curious before. He asked if he was concerned. Well, I thought that the... Well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> when there's an objection, Mr. Colby, if you would, uh, allow me to rule on the objection, and if it's okay to answer the question, I'll tell you that, all right? You've answered the question, were you concerned? The answer to that question is either yes or no. You've answered it yes. The answer is yes. Right. Next question, Mr. Right. What did you do after you saw the man return uh, to a point within five yards of Nicole Brown's Well, driveway? I thought that the man might be a... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct. I All called... Right. Hold, uh, hold on. Okay. Well, Listen, what? Mr. Colby, I, I realize you're not used to doing this every uh, day. Uh, Listen very carefully to the question that Mr. Darden or Mr. Shapiro asked you and answer that precise question, please. All right, Mr. Darden. Okay. What did you do after you saw the man return to the driveway? I called 911. Why did you call 911? Because I felt that the gentleman in question could be a possible burglar or intruder to my residence or to one of the residences in the neighborhood. Okay. Now, after you called 911, did you continue to watch the man? Yes, I did. And when I called 911, I told him it was, mm -hmm. that it was not an emergency. All right. Please, 
just answer Sorry. the question. Thank you. Okay. When you called 911, did you continue to watch the man? Yes, I did. Okay. What did you see the man do after you called 911? He went back to the original position and looked upon at the residence and then um, left. You know, as the man left, did you recognize him? Yes, I did. After I'd made the call, I recognized him. And who was that man? It was Mr. Simpson. Did you ever see the defendant approach the front door at Nicole Brown's home that evening? No, not that evening. Did you ever see Nicole Brown that evening? No, I did not. Okay. Could you see Nicole Brown's driveway at all that evening? Yes. Was her vehicle or her car parked in the driveway? I don't remember. I don't believe it was. Did you see the defendant's car in Nicole Brown's driveway? No. The defendant's car was around the corner. And how do you know the defendant's car was around the corner? Because I saw him drive away. Okay. Did you see him walk around the corner? Yes. Okay. Did you see his car parked around the corner? I only saw it drive off. And the corner you're referring to, that would be Shetland, is that right? Right. Into the cul de sac. Now, I believe you indicated before that your, that your home was located at the intersection at Shetland and Gretna Green, is that correct? Yes, sir. How far down Shetland Lane, how far away from the intersection uh, was the defendant's car the first time you saw it that night? Um, approximately 50 to 60 yards down. I saw the car as it departed. Okay. Now, what did you do after you realized that the man you saw uh, looking at Nicole Brown's home uh, w was, in fact, the defendant? Well, I was embarrassed that I'd called 911 because I didn't feel that uh, Mr. Simpson was a threat to, to me or to. Uh, to anyone else in our neighborhood. So uh, I did not uh, call the police back because uh, shortly thereafter the police did appear and I told them who it was and what the nature of the incident had been. Okay. Did you have any conversation with, with uh, the defendant prior to him leaving? No, I did not. Okay. Had you ever seen the defendant arrive at Nicole Brown's house late in the evening and, and just stand on the sidewalk? No, only that one incident. Did you ever see him outside in front of Nicole Brown's house late at night? No, I did not. If you know, what was he doing that night, the night that you saw him and called 911? Well, I think you can describe what he observed. Mm -hmm. oh, we'll... What was he doing? He seemed to be hesitant and to be attempting to perhaps observe something that may have been occurring within the house, but he never uh, took action and stepped onto the property of the house, or he didn't uh, do anything untoward. There's a big picture window in front of 325 South Brentwood Green. Is that correct? Yes, sir. We can put uh, People's 24 in the Alamo, Your Honor. All right, 24. And Mr. Colby, right to your right, there's a yes, monitor for you to look at what's being depicted. Yes, I see it. Mr. Darden. Where do you see the uh, uh, picture window? Where? Let's take a look at the uh, monitor. Where is the picture window located? Well, the picture window is um, far right-hand side. Yeah in the shadow of the trees to the right of the driveway. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, and you can see through that window from the sidewalk, can't you? Or do you know? Conceivably. Thank you. All right, Mr. Shapiro. Good afternoon, Mr. Colby. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm Robert Shapiro, one of Mr. Simpson's lawyers, and I have a very few questions for you right. this morning. Do you know uh, whether or not uh, O.J. Simpson was simply waiting for Nicole Simpson to arrive that night and meet her? I have no knowledge of that. Do you know if she was home? I don't know that either. Do you know if they had any prearrangements uh, that night? No. And as you say, you were embarrassed by the fact that you had called the police because really there was nothing suspicious. Overruled. Can you repeat the question again? You were uh, slightly embarrassed that you had called the police when you realized it was O.J. Simpson because there really was nothing suspicious that evening. Well, I can't speculate as to whether it was suspicious behavior or not. I, all I've said is that I observed the party on the sidewalk. And just a, a final question. Uh, one of the lawyers from my office, Sarah Kaplan, called you, did she not? I don't remember that. Yeah. Do you recall last week called and asked to talk to you about uh, your observations? Do you remember her or not? I think so. And you told her that you wouldn't speak with her? I believe I did say I didn't speak to her. Was she rude in any way to you or offensive in any way? No, but I, no. Thank you. Nothing further. Mr. Darden, any redirect? Why is it that you uh, refused to speak to Sarah now? I felt that um, to come forward and to speak to, to you, Mr. Darden, and to you, Ms. Clark, was appropriate behavior, and I don't attract the attention of the press or, or of any other party. By the way, that, that night, the night in which you saw the defendant in front of the house, uh, did you know that Nicole had filed for divorce? Yes. Thank you. All right, Mr. Colby, thank you very much for coming. Please don't discuss your testimony with anybody else except the attorneys until the case is over. I will. Right. Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much. Ms. Darden, your next witness. I'm getting the signal that jurors want a five-minute break. All right, let's take a quick five-minute break. All right, with the reporter, please. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, one or two other legal matters I need to take up out of your presence since we're five minutes to noon. I'm going to send you out to an early lunch. Please remember my admonition to you. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves for many opinions about the case. Don't allow anybody to talk to you about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has finally been submitted to you. All right, Deputy McNair, let's excuse the jury, but we will go back into session briefly for a few uh, discovery matters. parameters for uh, those missing articles, correct? Yes, and that, that is being done. We informed uh, the people early this week that we, in fact, uh, had done an extensive search and had compiled what we believe to be every public statement made by uh, 
Denise Brown regarding this case. And we do not feel that we have any legal obligation whatsoever to inform the prosecution of this, but in a spirit of cooperation and good faith, and in a spirit of trying to save time, because I feel that I will be using these documents for cross-examination, that the people will have adequate time uh, to get ready. All right. Counsel, I appreciate your having already made a copy. Save my staff some time. Thank you very much, Your Honor. All right, I'm going to order the uh, prosecution, since these are otherwise copyrighted materials, not to make any further photocopies of that. They may not be copied or otherwise disseminated, and they're to remain in your possession, Mr. Gordon, or possession of the prosecution team. Yes, Your Honor, we're awaiting the, uh, the other data search, and we'll conduct it as soon as we get it. All right, but given the parameters of what's left of our court day, I suspect we won't even finish direct examination today. So you'll have the weekend to uh, peruse those matters. All right, anything else we need to put on the record before we take our recess for the noon hour? No? Terrific. All right, and Mr. Shapiro, you're excused. And was that another beeper? Whose beeper was that? I don't have one. Left mine upstairs. Okay, that's not that was by you. All right, Deputy, uh, excuse me, Mr. Shapiro, you're excused until 2 o'clock. Thank you very much. All right, we'll stand in recess until 1.30, discovery matters and uh, other remaining motions at 1.30. All right, thank you, Counsel. Uh, they have indicated, uh, I believe, around January 4th, when we were provided with the uh, DOJ reports, uh, that they were done testing. Um, we, at that point, began discussions about getting access to the exhibits so that we could conduct our own independent examination. Uh, I would indicate to the Court that under the Sixth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, Mr. Simpson has a right to effective assistance of counsel, and in fact, we have an obligation to provide that effective assistance to him. Uh, fundamental to that right is uh, our obligation to examine all of the evidence that might be used against him. Uh, we c and we must be able to do that in a meaningful manner. Uh, right now, up to this point, we've only had access to this evidence from afar. When doctors uh, Bodden and Wolf were allowed to, to look at exhibits, they were instructed that they were not allowed to touch anything, they were not allowed to take anything out of any bags, they were not allowed to do any photographing. Uh, this is obviously one of the reasons why there are no reports from those people, because they would not prepare reports based on that kind of a cursory examination. That is not a meaningful examination from our standpoint. Um, Proposition 115 requires that we make available to the prosecution any uh, scientific reports, uh, evidence examinations that we intend to use. While 115 imposes certain obligations on us, it also uh, creates certain uh, protections for us. We are not required to turn over uh, expert reports or investigative reports that we do not intend to use in our case. And the reason for that is so that we can conduct an effective investigation. Uh, we may find some things that we don't like and we don't want to use, and that's our right to not use those things, and we don't have to turn them over to the prosecution. To allow uh, a prosecution expert to be looking over our shoulders, uh, as you will, while we conduct scientific testing is uh, in a sense, requiring us to make disclosure to the prosecution of the results of all examinations that we do, whether we like the results or not, whether we intend to use the results or not. 
um, I would point the court to the case of People versus or Prince versus Superior Court, uh, which is at 8 Cal App 4th, 1180, which I believe the court's already familiar with. Uh, that case involved a situation where there were two vaginal swabs, and uh, the court ruled that the defense had a right to uh, one of those swabs, uh, since the prosecution would have the other swab and could do whatever testing they wanted to do on that swab, and that the defense uh, would have the right to conduct independent testing out of the presence of the prosecution on the remaining sample. Uh, the basis for that ruling was the Sixth Amendment effective assistance of counsel. I would also point out that under um, Code of Civil Procedure 2018, which is the work product statute, uh, the policy of that section <coughs> is to preserve the rights of attorneys to, prevail, uh, to prepare their cases and to prevent attorneys from taking undue advantage of an adversary's industry and efforts. And I would submit to you that uh, testing that might be done by our experts at our direction uh, are certainly work product under that guise until the point where we decide that we're going to submit something to the court or to the jury, at which point the prosecution has a right to have that. Um, I, I might also add that we were not permitted to be present when this evidence was collected. We were not permitted to be present when it was transported or when it was initially prepared for analysis at uh, Piper Tech with the LAPD uh, people. Uh, while we have been allowed to watch, while some of the DNA testing has been, has been done, we have not been allowed to do any testing on our own. Um, the court has, up to this point, has been unwilling to impose any kind of timeliness uh, requirement on the prosecution. They've had this evidence for an extended period of time. Uh, I believe in your order, uh, your ruling on the Griffin hearing, you pointed out that the defense should use all, cons or the prosecution should use all conservative methods in order to preserve possible samples for testing by the defense. And we're at a point in time now where the trial has already started. We would like our opportunity to examine this evidence. And if we decide that we want to conduct a specific test, we think we have a right to do that in private and not reveal the results unless we decide that we're going to use those results. So with that, I would submit the matter and ask that we be allowed to, uh, that the exhibits be provided to us as soon as possible and that uh, we have no objection to them being there while we open them up and look at them and they can videotape that if they like. But at a point in time where we decide that we want to do a specific test, uh, we submit that we have a right to do that in private. So you have no objection to the presence of the uh, custodian of these items being present when they're displayed, examined, splits are taken, but for the actual testing, you want that done in private? That's correct. All right. All right. Are there any unusual items here, Mr. Blazier? You have the lists, uh, the numbers that you list on page two of your letter. Uh, are there any <coughs> items that are of unusual difficulty in handling? I don't believe so. I, I, I think... Most of the, or a lot of the items have been already uh, tested by the prosecution. Uh, we did not ask for large pieces of the Bronco. I don't, that might be troublesome to transport back there. Um, all of the coroner's exhibits are all relatively well contained and uh, ample quantity that if the prosecution wants to do further testing, presumably they could. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that there's anything that requires any kind of a special order. All right. Thank you, Counsel. Good afternoon, Mr. Harmon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Um, it's funny how we can live through the same events and have a different appreciation for them. Well, there's a jury instruction on that. Uh, this is all not in front of the jury, so. Um, a little history, I think, is in order. On November 28th, we wrote the court and told the court and counsel that the socks and the glove were back here, and if you wanted to do any sampling or examination, feel free to. We just wanted to videotape it. And I, uh, in light of Mr. Cochran's opening statement, I'm just thankful that they didn't take us up on that for reasons that will become obvious in a few minutes. So uh, some of those items, and those two in particular, have been here for months, and, and uh, no one took us up on that. Uh, much to our surprise, on January 9th, we got a letter from the defense team saying they wanted all their lawyers to go visit the lab the next day with, uh, and you know, those are not easy arrangements to make. And then they also said, uh, 
that they wanted designated items to be sent to Dr. Lee in any fashion we, des we desired, and they never designated them. And that's when I made the mistake of doing something that I had tried not to do in this case. I tried to discuss this with Mr. Sheck, and if you recall when we went on the record after that, I asked Mr. Sheck that whenever we had any communication, let's put it in writing so our memories can't fade and we can't uh, forget what really was discussed. So this latest letter is, or actually we responded to that January 9th letter on January 9th, and we said, and this is a quote, we are in receipt of your letter of January 9th, 1995. You have not provided us with adequate time nor given us sufficient information to intelligently respond to your request. Please file appropriate legal motions with the court. January 9th, nothing happened. January 30th, three weeks later, we get the letter that uh, brought us here today. And much to my surprise, the letter says that uh, Mr. Clark and I agreed to something. Now we agreed to agree to something when full information was provided. At that time, Mr. Sheck suggested that we abide by the rules of Selmark. And if you recall, this long before I was involved in the case, Selmark would allow defense experts to view testing. And we were very surprised that, um, that, it, that something like that would be so easily resolved between Mr. Sheck and I. And then nothing ever came of it until we read this letter reading that we had agreed to shipping everything when, in fact, no numbered items had ever been mentioned in any of those conversations. If there was ever any agreement, it was that our experts would be allowed to watch, to videotape the samplings, examinations, and tests, just as we have allowed the defendant to do at every turn in this proceedings the ubiquitous Dr. Blake, the ubiquitous but invisible Dr. Blake, continues to visit the Department of Justice. And this is done very cordially by them. They, they tell him when things are going to happen and, and change their schedule so that he can show. I think it's at this point we need to reflect back on something that I watched at, at home on television back in August, not realizing I'd be here. Ms. Clark offered to have the ubiquitous Dr. Blake do all of the testing, all of the PCR testing, that apparently, and I say apparently, is now being requested of this court. I'm somewhat surprised to hear Mr. Blazier, perhaps he hasn't been informed of this, and if he hasn't, it's, it's another curious event, say that they've never had any of the evidence. When you know, Your Honor, that you signed an ex parte order way back in October for items 47, 50, and 78, and those items were released to the defense team. Mr. Blazier apparently doesn't know that, uh, perhaps this is another one of these instances where they've tested something in secret and they don't even want him to know what the answer is. It's clear that, th that what they want to do is hide the ball. And I'm going to convince you today, Your Honor, that on many of these items the time has come to realize that this is not about finding the truth that's in that physical evidence. And physical evidence is a totally different category of evidence in this state that this is only about winning at all costs. The defendant has requested 184 items, most of the physical evidence in this case, to be transported to a laboratory on the East Coast right when we're in the middle of our case, or I shouldn't say middle, but right, right when we've begun our case. Some of them are really interesting and intriguing items. Now, they haven't said what they want to do with it. They haven't said what kind of tests they want to perform on it. And I think there are legal reasons why they have to specify that I'll address. They want number, I've, I've picked out some of the more intriguing items. Item number 118, it's a knife that Mr. Cochran had up on, on uh, Greg Matheson's report. It's a knife with someone, someone else's blood on it, other than the victims. That's one of the knives that, or one of the items they want to see. They want number 136, which was seized, by Ronald, or seized from Ronald Goldman's apartment on June 15th. Dino, the, uh, the autobiography or biography of Dean Martin for some strange reason. They want number 143, a knife found all the way down in Oceanside. Perhaps the most interesting item that, they, that they've... Oceanside, as in San Diego County? That's right, Your Honor. Okay. They must know something that we don't know. Um, 
the item that I found most intriguing and interesting is they want number 200, a cassette that was seized from Mr. Simpson's Bronco, Carlito's Way, the soundtrack. And all I could think of was perhaps they want to play it backwards like the Beatles' I'm the Walrus. And if you do that, remember you hear Paul is dead, there'll be a clue as to who really killed the victims in this case. You're dating yourself. Uh, it's, <laughs> it should be obvious. <laughs> Among the list of items are some items that are still being tested at Department of Justice. This, uh, this list was done very carelessly without any real consideration for what we have already told them. Items 79, 81, and 86, they're at the Department of Justice. They know that. We've told them that. What are those items? Uh, they are clothing items belonging to um, Ronald Goldman and, and Nicole Brown. I, I, I'm, I can't sort them out now. I don't, I don't quite have them memorized yet. In 303 and 304, and, and this is not inclusive, but I'm pretty sure it is, those are some stains from the Bronco that were collected uh, the second time around, I believe, in August. Those things are still at the Department of Justice, and we've told them that all along. No specific reason is provided for any of these items. No specific test is mentioned. And there are legal reasons why it's incumbent upon them, in my opinion, to provide that kind of specificity. So the defendant now wants all of these 184 items to be shipped off to the East Coast. What's interesting about the timing of the request, Your Honor, it's, a, it's made immediately after Mr. Cochran has publicly accused the prosecution of conducting unreliable DNA tests on contaminated samples, the same time he's accused someone in law enforcement of planting Nicole Simpson's blood on the defendant's socks. Because defendant or, or his team apparently seeks to perform tests which consume or alter some of these items of physical evidence forever, they have to justify under the authority of People versus Cooper what these items are, why these samples are needed, and who will perform the tests. If the DNA tests are being contemplated by the defense, how have those tests suddenly become reliable in their hands when Mr. Cochran has announced to this jury and the world that they're unreliable in their forensic application? Perhaps they're contemplating having Nobel Prize winner Mullis perform some of his cyberspace 21st century tests on these items. And hopefully, I, I add this parenthetically, hopefully the court will allow the people, when we cross-examine Dr. Mullis, to engage in some of the probe and questioning that Ron Shipp uh, underwent in terms of his uh, consumption habits and his bizarre scientific opinions. If Mullis performs these analyses, it will be the first time he's ever tested forensic evidence. Somehow, perhaps the defense has suggested that the way Mullis will do it will overcome the technology transfer point that uh, Mr. Cochran alluded to in his opening statement. Well, because of those shocking allegations, specifically with respect to Nicole's Simpson's or Nicole's blood on the defendant's socks, which Mr. Cochran made public for the first time on Monday, the prosecution presently intends to perform tests on those blood-stained areas of defendant's socks, which are able to detect the presence of the preservative in reference samples, in the sample that was preserved by the coroner. There is a preservative named EDTA in those tubes. They're pre-manufactured. There's a specified amount of that preservative in those tubes. We intend to pursue that with all of our vigor to refute the allegations which have been, which have cast a cloud over many of the people who worked in this case. Had these allegations been made months ago, we could have done this months ago. But for whatever reason, those ugly rumors circulated and circulated. And then finally on Monday, Mr. Cochran pointed the finger. Unfortunately, when he pointed the finger in his sock timeline, he left out one important event that totally undermines the chronology that he created or demonstrated in front of the jury. And the event that he left out was before that leaked story, the LAPD had done conventional screening on that sock and determined that the PGM subtype belonged to Nicole and did not belong to any of these other people. So it was known. That doesn't mean that the, it didn't appear that there was a leak, but that's an important part of the story that Mr. Cochran left out. 
we are under a legal obligation in light of these allegations under Brady versus Maryland to pursue this issue. Not that we believe it will produce exculpatory evidence, but we have an obligation to do so, and we intend to do so w with all the resources that may be available to us. And we also have a moral and an ethical obligation to pursue this. And this isn't any, any inquiry motivated by advocacy. This is a purely scientific <coughs> inquiry. We can't rely on tainted evidence. We have no doubt that the blood on those socks, which we have identified conclusively through multiple DNA test belongs to Nicole and was transferred there during the savage, brutal killings of Ron Goldman and Nicole. We have an obligation to those people whose reputations stand to be tarnished by Mr. Cochran's careless charges with no substance to them. The test will show that the blood on those socks, which Mr. Cochran admits is Nicole's, did not come from the reference sample that was laced with EDTA that was obtained by the coroner's office. It's a question of scientific truth, which can only be addressed by fair and impartial scientists, not attorneys whose interests are irreconcilable or her, whose careers serve to be promoted or advanced by careless charges such as that. In fact, we've invited and we continue to invite input from the scientific community about how to approach these tests and to design them in a way that there will be no question that when those tests prove that there's no EDTA on the stain that's been identified as coming from Nicole, there will be no question. No one will have a lingering doubt. At right now, we actually invite the defendant to join us in this search if they want to find out what the truth is about how those stains got there. Perhaps we can agree on a series of different tests to be performed by different labs overseen by a mutually agreed upon blue ribbon panel. If this is about finding the truth, We'll agree. If it's about winning at all costs, we won't. There are only two possible outcomes to this test. There's either going to be EDTA there or there's not going to be EDTA there. And we're willing to accept the outcome, whatever that is. One can only imagine the only reason the defense might not want to join in mutually agreeing on this is because they already know there's no EDTA there and they already know how that blood got there. We agree to accept those results in advance. We sincerely hope that the defense agrees to do so too. And we especially hope that should we prove conclusively through a series of tests, well-established tests in the scientific community, the defendant will not fall back on the dated legal artifice of People versus Kelly to try to prevent the results from being presented to this jury. That kind of tactic would only subvert the truth even more. I believe at this point we have demonstrated that those socks need to be maintained in our possession until we have had an opportunity to pursue this scientifically. That includes all the reference samples. And I'm, in, I'm broadening this a little bit too to include the other two reference samples for reasons I'll allude to. If we're forced at this point to turn over any of those items of evidence, that could compromise our ability to produce a definitive answer about the presence or absence of EDTA on the stain that's been conclusively identified as coming from Nicole on the so from the socks found in the defendant's bedroom. No court should force us to part with those items at this point. 